chapter 2 today, verses 6, 7, and 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6, 7, and 8. We've talked a lot, uh, quite a bit about wisdom. Still want to talk about it today. And uh, the theme of the lesson is believers lacking spiritual wisdom. Now that's, uh, you know, you think about that and you'll say, well, how could they lack spiritual wisdom? Well, there's a lot of believers that don't have that spiritual wisdom. And you think about divine wisdom. That's, that comes from the Word of God. Believe in what God's Word says, rightly divided. Or the wisdom of man. That's human viewpoint. You depend on some preacher or some individual to tell you what the Bible means and not read it for yourself. And not... When you don't read it for yourself, you'll never come to the knowledge of the truth because you don't have divine wisdom. When you read the Word of God right and divided, you see Romans 2, 5, Laman, that's to us, the rest of us for our learning. We read it all and believe it all and we write and divide it. You learn that and believe what you read, then you can, that's divine wisdom. So that helps you to understand believers lacking spiritual wisdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 6, How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor are the princes of this world that come to know. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Father, we're so thankful for your word. We're thankful for the opportunity to gather today. And we pray that as we gather and we think about Thanksgiving coming up and we realize that we should be thankful every day for who we are in Christ. And we are. And we just want to uh, thank you for what you've done for us, what your son died on the cross of Calvary for us. And we look forward to learning more today in your word. For we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Believers lacking spiritual wisdom. And you can see a big contrast between the two. Divine wisdom, that's what the Bible says, rightly divided. Or the wisdom of man. It's human viewpoint. What somebody tells you and you believe what they say without looking at it for yourself. Uh, and you know, man's wisdom, who's behind this wisdom of man, human viewpoint? Well, Satan is. He's, he's the God of this world and he loves for mankind to believe human wisdom. He loves for me to take the wisdom of man over the wisdom of God. And Satan's behind all that. And you'll, you'll find when you read in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 4. 2 Corinthians 2, 4. In 2 Corinthians 2, 4, notice what it says, 2 Corinthians 2, 4. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you of many tears, not that you that ye should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. You think about why Paul writes this way, there's an intent and purpose, and he wants their faith, you go back to chapter 1 Corinthians, he wants their, uh, their faith to stand in the wisdom of God, not in the wisdom of men. I've got the wrong verse on your notes there. But you'll find in verse 1 Corinthians 2, 6, it's where it's at. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But verse 6, you'll find here why he writes this. He said, how be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect? And to understand that word perfect, you know, you think about not sinless. I mean, we're, sinner, we're saved by grace. Our sins are forgiven when we believe the gospel. But do we sin? Uh, we do. We make that choice to do that. But that word perfect means maturity. That's a reference to maturity. And you, you, when you talk about maturity, you're talking about growth. You're growing in the, in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're saved. Uh, you've got, you understand the, you've got a Bible you can trust and you, you're reading, you're rightly dividing, you're growing. And these Corinthians were saved, but they weren't growing. And why do we know that? Well, you'll find in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, there in verse 1, Paul calls them babes in Christ. 
They're babes. They've never grown spiritually. They've never uh, learned what they should and, and grown on that. And Paul was warning them. He, uh, he, would, he was wanting to tell them about the hidden wisdom. You look in 1 Corinthians 2, 7. But we speak the wisdom of God and the mystery, even the hidden wisdom. Paul, he wanted to tell these believers about that hidden wisdom, but he couldn't tell them. Well, why could he, couldn't he not tell them about the hidden wisdom? Because of 1 Corinthians 3, 1. They're babes in Christ. It says, Now, brethren, could not speak unto you as in the spiritual, but as in the carnal, even as in the babes in Christ. So he couldn't tell them. And that's why you, you talk to people today, and you try to tell them about this hidden wisdom, you tell them about the mystery being hid and revealed to Paul to give to us, and they don't understand it. Well, why do they not understand it? Because they're babes in Christ. That's why. And that's what we have to understand. You, When you read 1 Corinthians 2, 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. That wisdom, that mystery was hidden wisdom which God, or, God ordained before the world unto our glory. So, what you've got here, and Paul is saying to them, this is advanced doctrine. This is advanced inf information uh, for you to learn. And only a mature believer is going to believe that and learn that. If they're not mature, they're not going to get it. They're not going to understand it. You'll hear people say, well, you believe in rightly dividing the word of truth. And I've never heard that, what people will say. Why have they never heard that? Because of Wisdom of man and human viewpoint. That's what they've learned all their lives since they've been saved. That's all they know. So what we have to do, we have to be gentle and kind with them and long-suffering with them, and we get it started out on the right foundation. And that right foundation is the gospel. Give a clear gospel message to them. The clarity of the gospel. What is the gospel? That Christ died for our sins and that he is buried and that he was raised again. Now that's the gospel. Give it to them and find out whether or not if they died right now, where, where will they spend eternity? And then when, once you under, you learn that and they give you a clear gospel, uh, they give you a clear answer on the gospel that they are saved, then you can go on forward. And you can give them some more doctrine about the mystery, about the hidden wisdom. And they need to grow. But until then, you've got to get that settled to start with. And then you think about advanced information for mature believers. It's just like we won't turn. Paul writes to the Ephesians. And you'll find in Ephesians 5, 14, he tells them, Awake thou that sleepest. Now that's part of the verse. Wake up. Awake thou that sleepest. So there was believers at Ephesus even though they had advanced doctrine, they were mature a lot of them were, they're still believers in that assembly that were not a t mature. They didn't get it. They didn't understand it like they should have. Uh, and when you're, a, when you don't grow, when you're on the human viewpoint and you've got the wisdom of man, what happens is you're not teachable, is what it amounts to. You can't, you're not taught. That, you, that's why you come into the assembly here and if you're not willing to open the Bible up and read it, uh, you're not going to be. You're not teachable, and that's that's very important that we see that and understand that. But these Ephesians were not teachable, and they weren't teachable in the way that to allow God, the Holy Spirit, to teach them. Now, how can I be teachable? Just use myself, for example. I'll open the Bible up in front of me. I'll read Second Timothy two fifteen. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing word of truth. So I understand by reading that, I've got to study. Well, what do I study? Well, Paul says to rightly divide. Well, how do I rightly divide it? Well, you figure out what Paul writes and what, compared to what the other writers write. And, and, I, and I, when I read, figure out Romans through Philemon, every book starts with the name Paul. So I figure that out. God and the Holy Spirit teaches me. Here, Paul is giving you this here. So read that and write, write and divide that and let allow the Holy Spirit as you read to teach you. Because if you're saved, you have the Spirit of God in you. And when you do that, 
then you can start thinking different. And I was just thinking the other day, and I put this in your notes, everyone ought to love to read. That's the first thing. And to study by rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, I've often thought, why do people not want to read? Why do they not want to rightly divide the word of truth? I'm talking about believers. Why do they not want to do that? And you know what? I, I came to the conclusion that some believers never have the appreciation for it. They don't have that appreciation. They don't see what God's done for them. Uh, they see what His Son did on the cross, and they believe that, but it, that's basically as far as they're going to go. Well, when you do that, you don't really, you're not planning for eternity. You're just living today for yourself, and you're living based on human viewpoint, and so you're doing it. And that's not the right way to do. I realize now, as old as I am, I have a responsibility, just like you. And I have a responsibility to build a house in my soul. And my soul, uh, you think about the responsibility of that, and the responsibility starts with this. Do I actually believe the Bible is the Word of God? Is that my authority? And that... That responsibility is on me. Do, do I believe that? And you, you're thinking in that way. <coughs> I didn't have the mic on, now I do. But by, you know, you think about, it starts by believing, do I believe the Word of God is the authority? And you have to have the authority to go any further. And if I don't believe that I have the authority, well, how can I go on divine wisdom? I can't. I'll, I'll end up wisdom of man, human viewpoint. So you got to start with the Bible and you go on divine viewpoint and you start building on that foundation that Paul tells you in 1 Corinthians 3. We won't turn over there. But he said, Paul says, I've laid the foundation. And that foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought about <clears throat> believers? And I can use myself as an example. Uh, you know, once you're saved, then you start out, and you, I had a tendency to believe human viewpoint, what everybody said was right in church. The church I went to, I thought everything was said was right. The preacher, the teachers, whatever, everything was right, and I went on human viewpoint. Instead of believing what the Word of God says and, and going on divine uh, wisdom viewpoint. Well, and then... As I go on, then I learn some how to write or divide the Bible. Then you've got you've got that issue. You've always you've got a conflict more in your inner man. The inner man says to write or divide the word. The old flesh says, No, you don't have to do that. That old sinful nature. And you back up. You won't read it like the word like you should. You won't learn like you should. So what happens? You get removed quickly. It don't take long for somebody to get out of church. Let me give you a verse. Turn to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. And look at verse 6. Galatians chapter 1. Now, you should know by reading the book of Galatians that these are believers. They're saved. But they have turned back and started... They, gone back and trying to live under the law instead of living by grace. Instead of taking divine wisdom. They were, they were going on the wisdom of man, human viewpoint, trying to live under the law. We're not under the law. We're under grace. So look what Paul says about these Galatians. Some of, some of them. Galatians 1.6 I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. They were soon removed. Notice that there. He says, you are soon removed. It didn't say over a long period of time. It says soon removed. It doesn't take long uh, for a person to leave. They left quickly. That's what you see there when you read that. And again, like I said with the Ephesians, there were some of them faithful, but there were some of those saints that weren't growing and 
living like they should as well. So, but you think about quickly, you know, and I have found this, I, I can tell you over the years being here, individuals, uh, I know for one example, this person I started teaching and she had never heard the right division. She started hearing it and got it, believed it, got excited about it, went, went away to uh, some business she was at and started telling other people about it. They put her down. They said, this is not right, what you're saying. Got her discouraged. What, what did she do? She quit. And it, it happens. That's Galatians 1.6 is a verse that you need to mark for yourself there. You know, faithful, faithfulness goes so far. I mean, you think about faithful men. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and in verse 2. 2 Timothy 2 2. Well, verse 1, 2 Timothy 2 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul's writing to Timothy. And he's young. He said, My son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. In the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Now, notice that the things that thou hast heard of me. Well, we didn't hear. We heard it through Paul's writings. Paul's already in heaven with the Lord. So you think about Paul. Paul's our spokesperson. He writes Romans through Philemon. But there's, a, there's links there in that verse. And notice he tells Timothy, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same that commit thou to faithful men. So who taught Timothy? Paul did. Well, what's Timothy to do? He's to commit that teaching to faithful men. Well, what are we supposed to do? We're just supposed to commit it to faithful men. You know what the truth is? We, we commit to faithful men. And I, I want to give you that. You know, a faithful, a faithful man, faithful person, lady or man, wants to do what God says to do. That's a faithful person. And... It's very important doing the, doing the work the way God wants it done. Everybody's got their opinion. Wisdom of man's human viewpoint. Human viewpoint says, no, we're going to do it this way. Well, the Word of God says, do it this way. So, everybody's got an opinion. Turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And look at verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 6. Paul says, How bit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. And again, remember perfect is a reference to maturity. He can only speak that wisdom to, to a person that's mature in the Lord. A babe won't never understand it. And not willing to understand it. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor are the princes of this, princes of this world that come to know. Notice that, yet not the wisdom of the world. And again, human viewpoint. That's all it is. And 1 Corinthians 2 8, notice that, that which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Did Satan know about the mystery? And the answer is no. You read verse 8 there, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They wouldn't have crucified him. Satan didn't know it. Those fallen angels, they didn't know it. They wouldn't have crucified him. And, and you think about that part. Now go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And look at verses 1 and 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. In Ephesians 2, 1, And you hath he quickened. Whenever you're quickened, you're made alive. That's what that word is. means. Who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's who we were. We were man. We had a dead spirit before we got saved. We were dead in trespasses and sins. 
I couldn't communicate with God as a lost man because my spirit was dead. When I believe the gospel, my spirit's alive. Now I can communicate with it. So that's what you see in verse 1 there. And you at the quickening were dead in trespass and sins. And notice what he says there. We're in time past, talking to the Ephesians. You walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You know, man walked according to the course of this world. And I did, and you did. A uh, man's soul was dark. He had a dead spirit and his soul was dark. He, had to, uh, he didn't want God. Uh, and, that, and that's the way we were before we got saved. And then you look on there about the course there. And, and where in time past you walked according to the course of this world. What do you think about courses? Whenever you were in grammar school, especially high school, college, if you go to college, you had to take courses. Well, what are courses? They're teaching material. The professors, the teachers, teach you what the course requires, the requirement is, taking those courses. And you look at this here in verse 2, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world. So, you know, that's what that's the way we live. We walk that way. Well, what's the course of this world teaching man? Well, the course of this world teaches man to love the creature more than the creator. That's what it teaches. You love, you love man. Love that creature more than the creator. More than you love God. And, you know, man's his own God. Well, and you think about the word prince there in 1 Ephesians 2.2. 2, that's somebody that's a chief ruler. That's somebody that has power, the governing authority of the air. Uh, Satan has a course for men to follow. He's the prince. He's got that course for mankind to follow. Mankind, the laws, follow him. That course that he's laid out for man to follow. But he also wants me to get off course. Of what I know, he wants me to soon be removed and go away from the Bible, divine viewpoint, divine wisdom, go away from it and get on human viewpoint. Human reasoning and all. That's what he wants out of us as believers. So he's got a course. And you know the course that Satan has by reading Romans chapter 1, you can find it, verse 25, it's a lie program. That's what it is. The course that I took with him before I was saved, I was in that lie program. I believed the lie. And that's all it amounts to. And now I'm saved, and I, I've learned the difference, and I know and understand a little bit more, and I understand that Satan's program, of course, is just a lie. It's not true. But so many people follow it. Even believers are caught up today on the wisdom of man, and Satan's behind that, that human viewpoint, that's a lie program. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, go back over there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And you reading 1 Corinthians chapter 2 again, this is for a perfect believer. This is for a mature believer. 1 Corinthians 2, 7. But we speak the wisdom of God and the mystery. Now I told you before, our mystery is a secret. Even the, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world and our glory. And we know that God kept that mystery a secret. We understand that. This is all advanced information here. You know, and when I read this chapter, and know, I know the difference now. I know the difference in the wisdom of God and the wisdom of man. I understand now. But how could I ever want to go back and follow the wisdom of man? I would never want to do that. But yet, people are so soon removed. Galatians chapter 1 there and verse 6. And you think about Satan. I gave you this last week. I'm going to give you a little more clarity on what I brought out. Turn to Ezekiel. It's in the Old Testament. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. Reading verses 1 and 2. 
I want to give you a little more clarity on this. Ezekiel 28, verse 1. Ezekiel 28, 1. The word of the Lord came again in me, saying, Son of man. Notice that comma there. Well, that son of man, that's Ezekiel. Ezekiel writes this. In the, in the, like it says, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man, and not God. Thou that, that thou set thine heart as the heart of God. So when you read that there, you've got the prince of Tyrus there. Well, look at this. Ezekiel 28, 12. Ezekiel 28, 12. And reading that, it says, Son of man, again, that's Ezekiel, Ezekiel 28, 12, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the Son, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now there's no doubt this is describing Lucifer. This is what he was, he, how he looked. And he was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty when he was created. But you'll find there, king of Tyrus. Now, he's, that, that's Satan. Well, you've got also the prince of Tyrus in Ezekiel 28 too. Would there be a difference between the prince and the king? And I believe there would be. And I'm going I'm to tell you something about that. In, in verse 3, Ezekiel 28, 3, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There's no secret that they can hide from thee. So, you know... Satan's going to find out about the secrets, especially with man. The only one he couldn't find out about was the Lord. So we, we mentioned that, but I, I, there's, uh, there's also some more there. You can go with 2 Timothy. We won't turn over there to that, or 2 Thessalonians about that. But there's a difference. But you look at Ezekiel 28 2, you know who's going to end up be the prince of, of Tyrus? the Antichrist in the tribulation period. He'll be the prince of Tyrus in the tribulation period. Well, who's behind the prince of Tyrus? Satan is. Let me give you this verse. Hold your place there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's not in your notes. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and look at verse 4. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4. So I want to clear that up for you there and let you see that. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4. Well, verse 3. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Talking about the Antichrist. Well, look at verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So that's the, that's the Antichrist in the tribulation period. And you can mark that with Ezekiel 28 and verse 2. You can study that out for yourself there. So you've got those there. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. No doubt Satan has wisdom. And no doubt Satan will find out secrets from man. But you look in 1 Corinthians 3.19, and Paul says 3.19, For the wisdom of this world, what's it say? Is foolishness with God. So what's that tell me? For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. So the wisdom of man and human viewpoint, what's God say about it? It's foolishness. That's what he says. 1 Corinthians 3.19 For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Notice that, you know, the question is, how long did God keep His secret, the hidden wisdom? He kept it from the foundation of the world until, look in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 6. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 6. He didn't reveal the mystery to any man prior 
to what you're going to read in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 6. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 6. Notice what it says. Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Notice that. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. You notice in verse 6 there, uh, who gave himself the ransom for all to be testified in due time. Well, when did the Lord reveal the revelation of the mystery to Paul? Or to, when did he reveal it? He gave it to Paul when he was saved in Acts chapter 9. It was held a mystery, it was a secret, all the way through that Old Testament. Now, we read this verse, but I want to go back to it. Deuteronomy 29, 29. You're talking about secrets. And, and notice what Moses says. Uh, Deuteronomy 29, 29. In, De in Deuteronomy 29, 29, notice this, what it says. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. So the secret things, remember that, belong unto the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. Now you notice they're talking about the law, so this is not to us here. It's for our learning. We're going to learn two things in that, this verse. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. That's the first thing. The second thing is, but those things which are revealed belong to us. And that's the nation of Israel. That's, that's given to them. So, you think about the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things which are revealed belong to us. Well, what did God reveal in the Old Testament? What did He reveal? Look in Genesis chapter 1. And sometimes we miss this. We're just reading too fast and not thinking about what we're reading. You look in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. What did God reveal in the Old Testament? In Genesis 1-2, in Genesis 1-1, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Now, did God create the heaven and the earth? The answer is yes, because He says He did. Verse 2, notice what he says. And the earth was without form and void. So what's the first three letters there after he created the heaven and earth in verse 2? And the earth. Notice that. So the Lord talks about the earth. It's revealed. The earth is talked about all the way in that Old Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All the way up until Saul saved in Acts 9. That's what's revealed to the nation of Israel about the earth, earthly, uh, the earthly ministry about the nation of Israel. Well, what does what does God reveal during that time? Well, He starts with Adam, and He goes to the seed of the woman in Genesis three. He talks, goes to Noah. He goes to Abraham. That's the children of Israel. Israel comes through Abraham. Talks about the little flock. Stephen in Acts seven stone. And that's when Israel blasphemes the Holy Ghost. Then he goes to Saul in Acts 9. He saves him by grace. Saul believes the gospel. Death, burial, and resurrection. The mystery, the hidden wisdom is revealed to Saul. His name changes to Paul. And why is it revealed to him? Well, you'll notice in Genesis 1 1, and in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Well, he talks about the earth all the way through. Like I said, all the way to Acts 9. But he doesn't talk much about the heaven. You think about that. Well, the heaven, and there's a reason for that. Because when you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, go back over and read this, and it'll, make, it'll help you here to see that. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, <clears throat> and look at verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 7. Howbeit we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. See that mystery there, even the hidden wisdom. That's what the mystery is. It's the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. That's why, that's why it was hidden. The mystery, the hidden wisdom was hidden and revealed to Paul to give to us unto our glory. 
And when you think about the glory, uh, turn to Ephesians chapter 3 now. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 3. And look, we'll read verses 1 through 5. Ephesians 3, verse 1. <clears throat> Ephesians 3, 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, that's us, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, <clears throat> which is given to me, to you, how that by revelation he, that's Christ, made known unto me the mystery. There's that hidden wisdom, the mystery. As I wrote a form, a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men. There's a comma. Nobody knew it in that Old Testament. Nobody knew it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Nobody knew it until Saul gets saved in Acts 9. And then it says, as is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And you think in verse 6, notice that word that, it means intent what, or purpose. What's the intent and purpose behind that? Uh, well, it's talking in, in verse Verse 5, which in other ages was not made known of the sons of men, well, the intent and purpose in verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in the gospel, in, in Christ by the gospel. So you think about that, well, who would be the that? That would be the Gentiles. He, God, you can see in that verse, he changed the program. The program in the Old Testament was for the nation of Israel. It was not for the Gentiles. God gave them up in Genesis 11 because they didn't want God. And he, he changed the... He gave the... Israel, he called them through Abraham. But you get it in Acts 9, Saul saved, and he changes the program. And that hidden wisdom comes into play. In time past, though, it was about Israel. Let me just give you something about Peter in time past. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 over toward the end of the Bible, 1 Peter chapter 1. And look at verses 9, uh, let's just read verse 11, save time. 1 Peter 1, 11. Peter's writing in 1 Peter 1, 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as a stranger and, pil and pilgrims, I'm in, the, I'm in the wrong one. What am I in? Verse Maybe it's 2 Peter. I may have a wrong word. No, I'm, let's see. It's the one about the sufferings of Christ. Y'all see the verse? I'm sorry. 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1. You know why I'm in? 1 Peter 2. Thank you. 1 Peter 1 11. Notice what Peter says, 1 Peter 1, 11. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ, no said a comma, and, of the, uh, and the glory that should follow. Now the suffering, you've got two things in that verse there. You've got the sufferings of Christ and you've got the, and the glory that should follow. Well, what's Peter talking about? The sufferings of Christ, he's talking about Calvary what Peter's talking about. He's talking about, in the Old Testament, you can see in Genesis, it talks about Calvary. Psalms and Isaiah talks about Calvary. I mean, everybody, Satan, everybody knew uh, things about that. But you find there in verse 11 too, uh, and the glory that should follow. Well, what glory is that going to follow for Israel? That's going to be the kingdom. Well, when are they going to have the kingdom? Well, we're the body of Christ, and we're going to be, be taken out and raptured out. There's going to be a seven-year tribulation period. Then the Lord will come back and set up that kingdom. And that's what Peter's talking about there, about the kingdom. It talks about, and the glory that should follow. Now, you think about us, about being made nigh in time past, as I said, Gentiles, we had no hope. So turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. The hidden wisdom was revealed to Paul to give to us. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13. Ephesians 2, 13. 
in Ephesians 2 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh, how? By, notice that, by the blood of Christ. It's by the blood we're made nigh. Look at verse 16, Ephesians 2 16. And that the, he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, not at the cross, by the cross having slain the enmity thereby. And you go right on down in Ephesians 3, 6, and notice what he says, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs in the same body and partake of his promise in Christ by the gospel. You've got to hear the gospel. He shed his blood on Calvary. As it says there, we're right now by the blood in verse 13, Ephesians 2, 13. And... In 2.16, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, took the cross, but were saved by the gospel. That's Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6. So, you know, there's a middle wall of partition between, in time past, Jews, Gentiles. What was it? It was circumcision. And that's, that's been torn down. So... Unto our glory. You remember reading that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7? You know, this was the hidden wisdom of giving. It's unto our glory. There's something for us. And it's because He shed His blood on Calvary by the cross. And we believe the gospel. By the gospel, that's how you're saved. You're saved by grace, not by works. Well, look in Colossians chapter 1. While you're close by. Colossians chapter 1. And verse 27. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27. In Colossians 1 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Notice that the, the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh, who is the glory? Christ is. In us, he's the hope of glory. The, the hope of glory there. You know, you think about our glory. When's it going to take place in the heavenly places? Whenever we're raptured out, we're taken out. We're going to meet the Lord in the air. We get a glorified body. Then, like I said, there's a seven-year tribulation period, and then, uh, but we're heavenly, and we get our. The, you think about the he heavenly places up there. And once we're raptured, we stand to judge the seat of Christ. We go into the throne room of God and meet God the Father. He gives us our job assignments in the heavenly places. And that's our glory. We're going to be there forever. And you, you think about the glory. And uh, what does the cross mean to us? I mean, you think it means more than milk. It means the meat part. It means maturity. It means that we're saved by grace, yes. We're saved by devil's hell. We don't have to go there. But it, the cross, because of that, I'm saved. There's eternity. There's heaven and places waiting for us. And until that time, I want to grow. I, I don't want to be a believer that's lacking spiritual wisdom. I want to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and build on that right foundation. So I encourage you to read and study and just rejoice based on who you are in Christ.